Hello and welcome to episode nine of Stump the DP. As always, I'm your host, Jim Pittman, and helping me out today is Mark. He'll be uh, taking the questions. Uh, Mark Baguski, I think I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, appreciate you being here, Mark. Um, we'll let you say hi here in a little bit when you unmute. But uh, before we jump into your questions, um, as always, anyone who's here live, thank you. And uh, go ahead and uh, post your questions or that you have a question in the chat box. Uh, they're on the Zoom meeting controls. Uh, just put a note in there for Mark and he'll be able to uh, unmute you so you can ask the question. If uh, you're camera shy or you don't have a microphone, it's okay, you can just type out your question and Mark will share it. Uh, so while you guys are working on that, I wanted to start um, by sharing my screen and uh, showing you something that I was working on uh, a little bit this week, some of my, my spare time. Uh, Carl recommended that I go back to our previous episodes and um, put in the description the uh, some timestamps. So here I just pulled up episode two. And uh, when you're looking at it on your computer, just uh, go down to the description. And you can see here we've got the questions or the topics that we had talked about in the past. And all you have to do is click on these blue time links and it'll take you right to those questions. Uh, the main reason Carl suggested it is this stuff is picked up by the search engines. So anyone who's searching for questions will be able to come. And then I also took a screenshot of my phone just to show you on the mobile version of YouTube. Um, same one here, episode two. Uh, and the trick is this little down arrow right here. When you tap on that, it opens up the description and you can scroll down and see the same time links. I also put them all together in a playlist. So if you're looking at a certain episode, it should automatically recommend or autoplay the next episode. So uh, some fun stuff there. And um, Rars uh, had emailed me some questions that were excellent. So I guess I'm gonna go ahead and just keep sharing my screen here. And um, let me go ahead, let's go ahead and unmute Rars. Mark, please. And uh, do you have those questions handy, Rars, or did you want me to pull up my email? I have them handy, uh, yeah. whichever you prefer. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, just run through the list. Uh, uh, so Rar sent me several questions by email last week, which uh, is not required, but I do appreciate having a heads up. Um, I will go ahead and explain to you guys what my, my process was for, um, uh, each search that I did and those kinds of things just to help make it uh, useful. But uh, go ahead with your first question. All right. The first question is about logging piloting command time, PIC. And it's, it's pretty specific. So I, I have a sport pilot certificate. And so I can log PIC time. I'm, I'm certified and I can log PIC time. But I'm taking lessons for private pilot certificate in a light sport aircraft. So in an aircraft for which I am certified to fly. So my, my first question here was, can I log PIC time while training with a CFI? All right, very good. And Mark, uh, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. If you don't mind just checking the participant list there and make sure everyone else is muted. I appreciate that. So logging uh, time, that one I actually do have memorized is 6151. And uh, that's a good one to kind of remember, put it in your toolbox. Uh, there's a lot of good information there. So I just pulled up the uh, ecfr.gov and um, I'm already on part 61. So if you go down to 6151, this is pilot logbooks. And I think it's uh, section E is an echo, has uh, logging pilot and command time. And, um, I don't have really any experience myself training sport pilots. That's something just mainly because of the part of the country I'm in, it's not real common. And um, uh, we you know, have complex airspace around here. So most people will go right for their private pilot. Uh, sport pilot is a great option, especially in, in uh, you know, various places or under certain circumstances. So I wasn't really sure when I first saw your question, um, but I knew what I was looking for. And that was this word right here. Um, under 6151 echo logging pilot and command my question was is sport pilot listed in this paragraph and the answer is yes and what this section says is as long as you have one of these pilot certificates and of course this is all FAA rules 
then um, it says that uh, except for this exception, um, when the pilot is the sole manipulator of the controls of an aircraft for which the pilot is rated. And I think this came up on our last episode briefly, um, but those are the key words right there, is that you're sole manipulator of the controls. And, uh, or um, has sport, pi sport pilot privileges for that category and class. The reason they have to do that separate is because on your sport pilot certificate, it does not say single engine land, does it? it I, I, I don't even know if I've ever seen one, but it should just say that you're a sport pilot and it does not have category and class the way that it, our other pilot certificates do. Instead, you have an endorsement from your instructor saying that you can fly single engine land, correct? Uh, let me go and take my pilot license out and check. Yeah. If you've never noticed, that is a difference. If you compare that to a private or a commercial or an ATP, uh, where we have a category and class um, right on our pilot certificate, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, sport pilot's different. Uh, you actually just get a sport pilot certificate and, um, and an endorsement for each category and class, which is kind of cool um, the, um, that the instructor can do that. So that's the way the verbiage is. Um, and uh, so what does it mean? The, the next question would be, what does it mean to be rated in an airplane uh, or an aircraft? And the FAA has written letters of explanation to clarify that. And it means uh, type rating if a type is required, like for a jet or category and class. So as long as you've got, in your case, the endorsement for sport pilot and the single engine land is what we're talking about, then as long as you're sole manipulator of the controls, the answer is yes, you can log PIC. And you found your pilot certificate. It doesn't say yes. single engine land on the actual certificate, does it? It does not. And it does say on the back that it's endorsed for single engine land, like you said. So they do print the endorsement on the back of the certificate? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, there you go. Um, but you would not need to get a new plastic certificate. My understanding is if you were to go add um, uh, a weight shift, you know, class or something like that, um, then uh, the instructor would just give you the endorsement. You'd be good to go after you receive training in that different category of class. All right. So uh, that's the first one. There's some more details here you can go through, but that's for your specific question. Uh, oh that covers that uh, and let me ask you there's a follow-up question so so I can log PIC time if I'm the sole manipulator of the control while training now uh, for private pilot license you train uh, for night flying as well so there is night cross-country night landing etc et mm -hmm. now as a sport pilot I'm not allowed to fly at night same so, thing, you would log the nighttime and you would log it as PIC because you are still the sole manipulator of the controls in your aircraft in which you were rated. Okay, um, yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that, and, that. and even, I mean, since you're already a pilot, um, and of course this is assuming you're flying a light sport aircraft because <laughs> that's what you're qualified. Right, yes. Uh, then um, even the time, like if the instructor wanted to take several minutes and demonstrate maneuvers, um, definitely during the day, you're still piloting command because you are rated in that aircraft. Um, so, but usually in training, you're the sole manipulator anyway. And if the instructor demonstrates something, it, it, you know, it takes a very short amount of the time. So, um, you know, rounding error is different than that. So uh, in most cases, so yeah, yeah, I would definitely log it as PIC uh, day or night. Um, now, if you go get into a, a 172 or something else as a sport pilot, um, that's a whole different situation. We're just talking about you flying the airplane or the type of aircraft that you're qualified in. Right. Good. All right, cool. What else you got? All right, so now I have some question about landings. So it's, uh, when you come to land, you are on shore final, you're gonna uh, round out and then eventually you're gonna flare. Mm -hmm. My question is about the round out, and I'm talking about general uh, GA airplanes, light airplanes. Is the round out is a gradual process that you kind of slowly round out and takes a few seconds, or is it more of a, a abrupt process? Kind of how many seconds would the round out take? So 
I've never had anyone ask me about the number of seconds before. I found that interesting in your question when you emailed it to me. Um, so before I answer, I'm curious to know how that came up. Was that something that someone taught you or someone else brought it up as a question? Or um, is that just kind of the, the way your brain thought about it? Like how quick should it go? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that I'm going to count the seconds or anything, but it kind of gives me a metric to estimate, okay, when you say slow, when you say fast, what does that mean? And also when I practice it in the simulator, I can kind of do it over and over and I can say, okay, let me try to do it slower or let me try to gotcha. do it faster. So um, I went ahead and went to YouTube, typed in the finer points, landings. I forget exactly what Jason called the video, but I think it's this one right here at the top. Uh, three tips for better landings. And I'm not gonna play it right now, but just to pull it up. Um, so Jason Miller, the finer points, uh, has a lot of great stuff on this. He talks about breaking it down. I think he does it in five phases where you have the approach, uh, round out, flare, touchdown, and roll out. And uh, when I looked in the airplane flying handbook, uh, round out and flare are synonymous. So whether you consider it four phases or five phases doesn't really matter. Um, the first thing that I agree with Jason on is you should think of it in these different segments. And um, the, uh, let me just, hi Jason, big, big Jason on my screen. The, uh, uh, the other thing that I got out of this video that I wanna share with you guys is um i thought he had it linked here so let me just see if i can remember real quick um i forget exactly what it was called uh landing technique but he refers to a landing technique that's named after a guy jacobson flair and uh, I learned this from Jason. I, I didn't know this before, but it's interesting because when you go and see what this guy has to say about the Jacobson flare, he says that it should be four seconds. So there is an answer to your question. It's not from the FAA, um, but I wanted to, to show you that. This is actually an app you can go buy. Um, I haven't done that. He has some videos on YouTube. You can go look at that. But it basically has to do with learning where to put your eyes, learning what the aiming point is, and then that point where you go from the approach where you're stabilized and you're pointing at a certain spot to the point that the wheels touch down is about four seconds. And it doesn't really matter whether you're flying a 757 or a 152 because assuming they're both on a three or four degree glide path, which is normal for different airplanes um, or the same airplanes, then uh, you know the faster you are going forward, the faster you are going down. And uh, so it's still about the same four seconds. It's not exactly four seconds. Um, there's other things, especially in lighter airplanes that, you know, it's gonna change depending on um, gusts of wind or updrafts, downdrafts, all that kind of stuff. So um, there's a reference for you. About four seconds would be one answer. The, uh, rather than getting too focused on the number of seconds, um, going back to what Jason was saying about splitting it up into different segments, you can say, hey, that was a really good approach, but I started the round out too soon, therefore I ended up high. Or I started too late, therefore I had to hurry and jerk the nose up. Uh, and it's a way to kind of grade yourself on the different phases of the landing um, instead of just saying generally that was a good landing or a bad landing. So I think that that's really good advice. Uh, go watch that other one, that video from Jason, three tips for better landing. He'll go through some other details there. but. Uh, Hopefully that uh, gives you some, some guidance anyway. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Tim. That's helpful. All right, what do you got next? All right, so it's also a landing question. And let's uh, imagine we are in a, in a GA airplane. We are, going, we are in the pattern, entering the pattern, and we're going to land. So a beam the numbers, we're going to reduce power, apply 10, 15 degrees of flaps, and then we're gonna start descending. So we're gonna soon reach the turn from downwind to base. And right at this point, so as you as you are you gonna start descending, so you're probably gonna be 200 feet below traffic pattern altitude right now. So you are at this corner from downwind to base. And say you lose the engine now. So I I 
I tried this in a simulator and it seems because you are a little slow, uh, already slow, you are a little low, you have the flaps, from that corner, I, I'm not able to make the runway. And is this normal? Uh, and what would you do and how would you eliminate this risk? So the risk of an engine failure not making it to the runway. Yes. Um, so uh, eliminates probably to, too much of a promise, but we can certainly mitigate the risk by staying closer to the runway. And in my observation, at least in the part of the world where I'm flying, I think that's a little bit of a lost art. Um, the, um, maybe that's the wrong way to say it. So engines have gotten a lot more reliable in the last 50 years, <laughs> 80 years, whatever, you know, time frame you wanna look at, but, but certainly in the last 20, 30 years, uh, engines have, have become a lot more reliable. So, you know, it, it wasn't that many years ago, like uh, a couple generations ago, pilots, where an engine failure, it, it really wasn't a matter of if, it was when. And and it was just part of learning to fly is, hey, we're going to have an engine failure sometime. So um, what I was taught even 27 years ago when I started flying is uh, always stay within gliding distance of the runway. So, of course, that's going to change with the type of airplane you're flying. But I was taught to fly what a lot of people would consider a tight pattern for the exact reason that you're talking about. Um, so that if we did have any kind of a problem, especially a total engine failure, that we could glide to the runway no problem. I think that that is not being emphasized as much these days, maybe because engine failures are not as common, but they do still happen. And... Um, uh, at my particular airport uh, in North Phoenix, it's one of the busiest airports in the world. It's not uncommon to have, we have a north runway and a south runway that are parallel, and we have two different tower control frequencies. So it's really like having two different airports shoved together. And um, it's not uncommon to have five to eight airplanes in each pattern, where, where we have, you know, 15 airplanes at the airport at any one time in the pattern going round and round on the north side and the south side. So um, we have to get extended out three, four miles on downwind before we're even allowed to turn base. So sometimes it's out of your control uh, if it's busy like that or if you're giving way to IFR traffic or some other reason. So um, let's simplify your question and, and or uh, the scenario and just say that you're the only one in the pattern, non-towered airport. What size pattern should you fly? It is still good advice to keep your pattern tight enough that you can always glide to the runway. So that's a discussion I would recommend that you have with your instructor. Um, you're flying a, a light sport. Um, it's the Remos that you're flying, right? Correct. So I think I did a demo flight in one of those years ago. I don't have a lot of experience, but um, you know, you obviously were just sharing how in the typical pattern that you were taught to fly, it's pretty iffy if you're going to make it gliding. So I would recommend bringing that downwind in a little bit closer to the runway. Uh, not a lot. It usually just takes a little bit. If you use the technique of 45 degrees behind your wing, uh, your touchdown spot to, to know when to turn base, remember that when you're in tighter on downwind, that means the base will be closer to the runway as well when you get to that 45 degrees. So bringing in a little on downwind, you hit that 45 degrees sooner, looking at the runway over your shoulder, um, then when you turn base, you're closer to the runway. And um, I think you'll find that that, that works out um, pretty well. Mm -hmm. So is that, is that anything you've talked to your instructor about specifically, gliding to the runway? Uh, not this particular kind of corner case in a way. Because we, we usually practice power off from the uh, beam the numbers. And that's no, no, not a problem. It's never a problem. Yeah. Hey, Jim, uh, Joe's Please. wanted to make a comment. Please, go for it. Uh, if you, can, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, can you Joe hear me? Joe Stanley. Hey, buddy, glad you made it. <laughs> hey, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it sounds great. Did you get a new microphone? <laughs> no, it's the same one. Uh, okay, so the suggestion is if you read the FAR AIM, um, it says that you should complete your, your turn to final within a quarter of a mile from the runway. That's a suggested... Um, uh, thing in the far aim so or in the aim so if you're completing your turn to final within a quarter of a mile of the runway and you're using those 45 degrees off the end of the runway that should give you an idea how close to the runway you should be on downwind I find that to be somewhere around half to three quarters of a mile from the edge of the runway 
And uh, by the time you complete your turn to final, you will be about a quarter of a mile from the runway if you're close enough. If you're a mile and a half out, which I find a lot of people doing nowadays, which is really annoying when you're trying to teach students the proper traffic pattern procedures and to remain within gliding distance. Um, when you're a mile and a half out, your 45 entry is gonna be a lot further out too, and you're never gonna make the runway. So if you're at least a half to three quarters of a mile away and you're all the way at that point where you're starting to turn base, if you make an immediate turn toward the runway, you'll make it no problem at all. Very good, and thank you, Joe, for reminding me to uh, provide official references. So we're in the, uh, the AIM uh, 433 traffic patterns. And um, it's probably somewhere else, but it's also here in these example notes. Uh, complete turn to final at least a, a quarter mile from the runway. So it could be more than that, depending on the airplane you're flying. Certainly if you're in a Mooney or a Bonanza, uh, you know, that base turn is going to look different. Uh, or Cirrus, anything else that goes faster. Um, I do the same thing, in, even in a Saratoga, I do the same distance. I just adjust, I don't adjust the pattern. I just adjust my power settings and when I start my descent. So I'm still tied to the runway in a Saratoga. And um, I just, you learn your different airplanes and the speeds and what you have to be at. And if you adjust, your, learn to adjust with your power and uh, rather than extending the pattern further and further out, then it makes it a lot easier. Very good. Just a quick uh, side note that um, I notice a lot of pilots don't learn and it's something that we use all the time in the airlines and that is um, the three to one rule and that's a mental math tool that works on a lot of different things but specifically here I'm thinking about for every mile you are from the runway on final you should be about 300 feet above the runway. That's uh, roughly a three degree glide path. When you do the trigonometry it's actually like 318 feet <laughs> for every mile, uh, nautical mile, but 300 is close enough. Um, or uh, so if you're doing a straight in, you know, a lot of pilots are like, woo, I got cleared for a straight in, this is easy. Straight in visual approaches are actually one of the most difficult maneuvers for any pilot to do, mainly because you don't have the usual cues of when to configure, slow down and start your descent. So if you're entering say a five mile final, five times three is 15, you should be about 1500 feet above the runway when you start that three degree glide path down. And, um, you know, I'm based with my airline, I'm based here in Phoenix, so uh, flying in the Southwest, you know, it's almost always VMC, and we get cleared for visual approaches all the time. And, th and that's the rule we use, you know, we're cleared for visual, hit that five mile final at 1500 feet or that three mile final at about a thousand feet, you know, 900 to a thousand. And it works out really nice every time, as long as you're on speed and you're configured properly. Um, so that's a, a little side note there. Um, so a one mile final, 300 feet, uh, the, you know, a quarter mile final, you're not very high above the ground. So, uh, that's why the aim says at least a quarter mile from the runway. You want a chance to get stabilized there on, uh, on final. So, uh, good stuff. Um, was there any more to that part of the question, Rars? Uh, Greg had a, qu Greg had a comment as well. Please. Hey, uh, Raris, this is a, a trick that actually I learned relative to emergency landings, but it's great for this question you've asked. It, when you're at that point, uh, opposite the point of landing, when you make your power reduction, visualize your path for the rest of the way to touchdown, the rest of downwind base. And, oh, knocked over my mic, excuse me. Uh, visualize your path like a string. Think about a string extending from the from the nose of the airplane down around those two corners. And the significance of that is that you can control the length of that string, right? So if there's a tailwind or if you're configured a little, a little differently than usual or, you know, you lose an engine, you're always visualizing that string and you can shorten that string, right, by cutting the corner. If that string tells you visually that you're not gonna make the runway, then you have given up that opportunity to perhaps continue the approach and touch down. And the other way this works really great, which is where how I learned it, and I don't remember from whom, unfortunately, is for emergency landings. You know, most of us uh, teach that you should find a, a, some place more or less below you and circle down, because that's another place where straight in never works. And, uh, if you circle down and put yourself at a point 
where you would make the power reduction in a normal landing relative to your emergency landing site, every time you circle around once more, you think about that string and think, is this the time? And then you can control the length of the string to get to the runway. But uh, it, it gives you, I recommend thinking about that every single time you're at that point, every time you fly, so that you become, that string gets more and more accurate with your experience. It's very effective way to determine whether you're too far out and what you need to do if you lose the engine. Great. Greg, you sound like a pilot that was taught to fly gliders early in your career. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I've never thought of it as a string. I, I like, that's a great visual. Um, I'm gonna start using that. Um, kind of going back to the straight in landing, you know, imagine you're coming in on a, on a three, four, five mile straight into your runway. You're nice and stabilized. How do you know when to go down? Not only is there the three to one rule, but thinking of that string in your mind's eye, imagine a normal pattern where you're looking out at the runway in front of you and you, you see the normal downwind base and final where you know where to do configuration and power changes. Just take that string from downwind to beam and pull it out to where you are on final. And that's the same distance that you would normally travel downwind base and final. So just kind of visualize that string stretched out. And I think that's a great way to do it. So good stuff. All right, Rars, keep her going. All right. Uh, so the next one is I have some graphic. Uh, it's about performance. Uh, you want me to share the screen? Yeah, go ahead. You should be able to share yours. All right, let me do that. Uh, can you see? Yep, that's perfect. Mm. All right, so this is a performance table I, I pulled out from the airplane I fly. It's a Remos GX and it has a Rotax engine. And the the POH list this table is for this specific propeller and just gives you one table. And basically mm -hmm. you have engine RPM here and then third column is the airspeed, true airspeed. And it gives you true airspeed at 3000 feet pressure altitude. Uh, with this engine setting, you're gonna get this true airspeed. Mm -hmm. Now my question is, what about if you're flying at 5000 feet? Well, you don't always do all your flights at 3,000 feet? Come on. <laughs> that would not work here in Arizona, I'll tell you that. So, um, great question. Again, disclaimer, I've never been checked out on the Remos, uh, but you were nice enough when you emailed me, you included the link to the POH. So, um, it may be different for different manufacturers. So, the, the educational part of this and what I did first is I went looking in the notes that are in section five of the POH and the introduction of section five of the POH to see if they had any calculations that could be done uh, that are approved by the manufacturer. And clearly, uh, so I I have been checked out in the, um, uh, oh no, I'm not remembering, the uh, A5, the Icon A5. Uh, a couple years ago, I was doing some work helping to ferry those around. Cool little airplane, by the way. And um, so that one, I did have official training. That's the only light sport that I've received factory training on. And the POH is very similar to what you see here with the Remos. There's not a lot of information. So clearly the requirements from the FAA uh, are not as detailed when it comes to a light sport aircraft. And I think part of that is because it doesn't really matter as much, <laughs> uh, meaning the, um, the altitudes that you're flying at, uh, you're, not, you're not having a big change in altitude typically with a light sport aircraft and a couple you know, knots difference in true airspeed uh, you know, with changing altitude isn't gonna make that big a difference. So they just give you this generic 3000 foot chart. I was not able to find anything in the Remos book about um, any calculations, you obviously already looked, you already knew that. Uh, just to point out though, for the takeoff and landing where things are a little more critical, they give standard numbers, but then they give tables of um, factors. So if you're doing it on grass, you know, add this percentage. If you're doing it at a higher altitude, do this percentage for each thousand feet. So for takeoffs and landings, there are formulas or calculations to be done to figure out um, more accurate takeoff and landing. So that makes sense. But here at Cruise, um, the answer is no. <laughs> that's, that's my answer for you to your specific question of can you calculate for 6,000 feet? The answer is no. That being said, um, go ahead and stop sharing your screen and I'm gonna share mine. 
And on a related topic, um, there's uh, so the rule of thumb is the uh, to talk about the difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed. For every thousand feet you go up, it's about a two percent. I'm sorry, yeah, two percent increase for each thousand feet. And um, so I went and found Bold Method. Um, they have this uh, why are true airspeed and indicated airspeed different? And uh, it's a great video, not exactly the question you're asking about, but um, they get into some details about compressibility and things that are interesting. But uh, I thought this was great to go ahead and show you guys the, um, the calculations because uh, Bold Method does a fun job putting these graphics on their videos. They have special uh, software that they use to show like a heads up display right on their videos. So this is real data in their Cirrus. Uh, they're somewhere in Colorado, and they climb up to flight level 240. So um, starting at sea level, the, again, the rule of thumb is that true airspeed will be 2% greater than indicated airspeed for each 1,000 feet. Well, here we are at 7,000 feet. So grab my calculator. And um, so 2 times 7 is 14%. Well, you see we have an indicated of 89. So we go 89 times 1.14. So that's a 14% increase. And that means our true airspeed should be 101.46. Look at that. So that's kind of cool. And then we take it up even higher. And here we are. Let's go up. There's nine. All right, 9,000 feet. Let's just do this a couple times just to show how it changes. So 9,000 feet would be 18%, just you know, double how far you are above sea level. Um, so 125 is our indicated. If you don't have a fancy glass cockpit that calculates your true airspeed, just take that times 1.18 and our true airspeed should be 147.5. Look at that. I mean, it's within a knot. <laughs> uh, and then the last one. Um, so they do talk about the fact that when you start going faster um, and they claim over 100 knots, that's when compressibility comes in. It's uh, according to what we're doing here. Sorry, I got I got all you guys in the way here. Let me move my little preview. Um, it's really not that much of a difference. So here we are basically flight level 240. So that would be 48%, right? So uh, 125 is still our indicated times 1.48, our true, whoops, 48, our true airspeed should be 185 within two knots. So that's a good rule of thumb um, to remember uh, two percent for each thousand feet, and that they explained it in this video. So I'm not going to go into details, but it just has to do with the thinner air, and uh, the fact that your airspeed comes from the pitot tube. And um, instead of thinking of the pitot tube as measuring airspeed, think of it as a counter. It counts air molecules per second. So you're going through the air at a certain speed, but it's just counting air molecules going into the pitot tube. So the higher you go, the further apart, the farther apart the air molecules are. Um, it's not counting as many per second. So that's kind of the way to think of that. All right, again, a little off topic, but um, thought that would fit in nicely right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Sonia had a good comment as well. Please, Sonia. Go ahead and uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Where'd my share button? Well, I was just, I was just wondering, I'm actually a fan of the E6B and I, would find it easier to just plug the number in two seconds and you have the value too. Yes, so the E6B is a great way to do it. Um, a little tough if you're using the, the whiz wheel manual one when you're flying. Um, any of the density altitude, true airspeed tech calculations that require you to line up your pressure altitude with the temperature, that's a very fine tuned. <laughs> like usually takes me both hands and looking really close uh, to get it just right. So that's kind of tough to do when you're flying, uh, but a great skill to practice nonetheless. I, I am a fan of the whiz wheel. So. All right, very good. All right, Rars, uh, I think you had a couple more. What do we got next? Yeah, the, uh, those were the hard ones. Now are the fun ones. Time for the fun ones? Okay. I hope I know what you were getting at with these. We'll find out. <laughs> so. so this is a picture. This is a satellite picture I took from Google Earth. So what's wrong with this pavement marking? 
Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that I believe that that's a, is that really a satellite picture? Is it, is it Photoshopped at all? No, it's not. It's a that, real picture. That's a real picture, huh? Yeah. Um, so I don't know that anything's really wrong with it. It, uh, the first thing that went through my mind when you emailed it to me is, wow, those runways are sure close together. Um, there's not a lot of room between the runways. Um, the uh, what airport is that? I'm just curious. Uh, it's uh, let me let me uh, well uh, let me pull it out for you. And, yeah, and I'll yeah it that'd in. be great. Uh, it's uh, it's in Hawaii actually. It's Honolulu. So while you're doing that, um, the only thing that caught my attention that I think you might be getting at is something that came out uh, in recent history. I, I forget how many years ago they started doing it, but um, they're called enhanced centerline uh, markings. I think is the official term. And that is um, at certain airports, they started doing this uh, where within 150 feet of the hold short line, they started adding the uh, dashed lines on each side of the taxiway line within 100 feet of the runway hold short line. So it's a way that a, a pilot who's not familiar with the airport or not paying attention, um, if you're at least watching the center lines of the, uh, of the taxiway as you approach a runway, uh, you'll see the, these enhanced markings that let you know you're within 150 feet. These runways are so close together that it's there is no 150 feet there, um, so it's they just have those enhanced lines right in between. So, yeah, those those are definitely close together. Uh, what what airport did you say this is? Uh, Honolulu. Oh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Yeah. All right, very so, good. So I have there. a phone there. <laughs> One time, my, my <laughs> wife and I, when we went out, I uh, hooked up with a friend that uh, that I knew from my Cessna days, and we rented a 172, and that was, that was beautiful. You guys, actually, those are the first pictures that come up. If uh, anyone wants to see, go to, because of their chronological order, and this was years ago, um, go to my website, flywithjim.com, and over in whatever the right menu is, resources, I have Jim's flying pics. And the very first ones that come up are, are that flight around uh, Honolulu. We actually went all the way around uh, um, the island. So anyway, so what was, was I on the right track or, or have you officially stumped the DP? I, I think, so I think the idea, so uh, the idea here is you actually need a, a clearance to the other runway before you can exit the current runway. Yeah, because you, unless you're in a really tiny airplane, <laughs> there's no way you're going to get clear of the runway you're exiting and hold short of the other runway to make a radio call. So that that's absolutely true. So is that mainly what you were getting at? Uh, actually, hold on a second, I think. Looks like they moved them. You can see all that dark black, like they used to be in a different location or something. I think, oh, this is what I wanted to say. Oh, great. See, now I don't have time to do my homework. I see how you are. All right. Um, how about so we, this one? So we have multiple hold short lines. That's unique. Um, and so you can see those enhanced center line markings I'm talking about. I'll go ahead and zoom out a little bit. You can see they start 150 feet before the uh, runway. Uh, yep, that's, that's what I was talking about. So that's important to know about. And then um, we have multiple hold short lines because of the intersecting runways. Go ahead and zoom out a little more. People can see we got eight and two six crossing four and two two. So when you're holding short there, you're actually holding short of two different runways. Um, but but see, Jim, so you are on this runway, so you are here, you just landed, right? Yeah. You are taxiing out, you are still on the runway, right? You you didn't cross the hold markings. Right, there's no exit line, is there? This, this is the exit line, and the point is uh, that before you actually can exit, you actually need a clearance onto the other runway. Because by go. the time you exit, you are on the other runway already. That does seem backwards. So I do have an answer for it though. And it has to do with the standards set by the FAA of how many feet hold lines have to be. I, I, I assume they do it from the center line or maybe it changes with the width of the runway, but there are very specific standards of where the markings have to be. And those standards have changed over the years and they're usually different than when the airport was built. So as the FAA, um, comes out and, and you know refines or updates these standards, uh, some airports have to get creative. <laughs> Meaning if this airport was built from scratch today, 
they wouldn't have put these runways so close to each other. So, so that's a good point. You actually cannot even legally exit uh, the runway. I guess is that for right um, that you're landed on? Are yes. Eastern more oriented yes. north. <laughs> Yeah, so you cannot exit for right until you yes. get clearance to enter one of those other runways. That is very unique. Uh, but it doesn't change the markings and knowing what the markings mean and knowing that the solid side is the side you can't pass without a clearance. But but yeah, if, uh, if there was a radio failure or congestion on frequency and you just landed and pulled off there uh, and you did not have a clearance to enter one of those other runways, you absolutely would have to hold short and occupy runway four right until you get a clearance to enter one of those other runways. So right. that's a good one. That makes me feel better. I was wondering what you were getting at with that other one. Just <laughs> they're close together. <laughs> and I yeah, think you no, had one know. more. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. this this is also fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I'm an honest guy. I've got to admit to you. I already knew the answer to this one as soon as I saw it. And um, I saw this online recently. I don't know if it was in Greg's group. Do you remember where you saw this? Because we uh, probably no, saw I, the same place. <laughs> so well, let, me, let me phrase the question. So uh, you have this, uh, this part of sectional chart. And the question is, what is this gray yeah. line here? Gray yep. thick line. Great and question. <laughs> That's a good I, stump the DP question. Unfortunately, I already knew the answer. <laughs> so now, um, since you're sharing, do you want to go ahead and pull up skyvector.com? Yes. And we'll let everyone see. Uh, if there's any guesses, uh, again, this is a game show with absolutely no prizes. But if anyone has an educated guess and you didn't see this on social media like Rars and I apparently did, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll see if anyone else knows. But um, uh, do you remember where you saw this, Rars? Because I was, I was uh, trying to remember, and it wasn't anything I dwelled on. It just kind of like flashed past in social media. And I was like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So I actually didn't see it on social media, but I do have the chart on my wall here. And I okay. keep looking at it from time to time. And I, keep, I saw it, I ran into this twice. And I was like, what is that marking? Did and you I, post I, about this online anywhere? No, no, I did not. Okay, then that, that's a very strange coincidence because I swear sometimes since I've been sheltering at home in the last few weeks, I saw this flash by and it made me smile. So, all right, um, we're still not seeing Sky Vector. So go ahead and pull that up on this browser. Here, can you guys see now? All right, zoom out a little bit more. So this is the, the mark we're interested in, yep. right? That's a pretty good clue right there, but are you guys seeing it? <laughs> So it's, it's, a, it's a word, it says Sierra. Those are the Sierra Nevada mountains. So that, that bar is the letter I in the word Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> you like that, Joe? So yeah. add, add that to your, uh, your stage check, check ride questions. Nice. Um, no, actually, so that being said, the FAA does teach us, I just went through recurrent training um, last week, they ended up doing it online. So my, my recurrent DP training, and uh, they emphasize we are not supposed to ask trick questions. <laughs> I don't know if that's a tri trick question. Um, it certainly falls towards GWIS, but there is an important pilot skill here. And even if I hadn't seen this on social media and uh, seen the answer, um, I would have done what I always do when I see something new on a chart. I would have zoomed out. Um, that's that's the, the first good thing to do is just take a step back and be like, what is this color I'm looking at? What is this line? What is this whatever? And then the other thing, of course, is to go to the legend, um, which is not going to help you on this one because it's just a letter in the word Sierra. <laughs> so, all right, that was fun, Rars. Uh, thanks for being prepared with so many good questions. And, and thanks again for uh, giving me a heads up. So I, uh, I could do a little bit of homework looking at that POH and the other stuff. So cool. And is, is that good, Rars? Any, any other follow-up questions on any of that? So. No, no, I'm good. It's, cool. uh, it's it's great, Jim. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, you're welcome. I know you got to go um, before the hour. So um, um, thank you again for being here. Drop off whenever you need to. Mark, uh, how are we doing on questions? Got any uh, thing coming in? Uh, we don't have anything else, but I've got a follow up for you. Um, you were showing the traffic pattern a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And would you comment on if you're landing on runway 18 and you know, maybe doing touch and go and then want to take off to the north? How would you recommend doing that? So you're landing to the south. You want to do a touch and go and go to the north. Yep. 
Uh, well, it depends on the airport, um, whether there's multiple runways and, you know, different airports have different local procedures, but usually just a left downwind departure would be the, uh, the appropriate way to do it. Um, the idea being that you would climb above the pattern at VY. So, you know, as quickly as possible, hold a VY climb until you can, uh, you know, get several hundred feet above the pattern because you don't want to be in the way, especially if this is a non-towered airport. Um, but even at a towered airport, those are the, that's the risk you want to be thinking of is even though you're departing on a, on a left or right downwind, you don't want to be in the way of someone coming in on a 45, that kind of thing. So um, now the question is, did you stump me? Because there's something in the aim that contradicts what I just said. <laughs> uh, do you have a, a specific reference you're thinking of or anything different than that? Well, you actually had the traffic pattern up there earlier. Yeah, let me see aim. if I close that. There we go. I'm glad I answered the same thing to my student as you said, but uh, <laughs> that at least makes you feel better. <laughs> well, you know, they, what they say is uh, great minds think alike, but fools seldom disagree. So you got to be careful. <laughs> All right. So go ahead. Well, just as you note, uh, the, the two departures they show here are just straight out departure or 45 degree departure. And, and that a downwind departure is not official FA, is that the argument? <laughs> I don't know if it's an argument, it's just, just a question. And, no. uh, you know, based on looking at this in the aim, I didn't know if the preferred procedure would be like the 45 degree departure and then fly out away from the airport and then turn north. Or I've, I've always just gone crosswind, downwind, and continue, continue climbing out of the pattern, like you yeah. mentioned, or climb out at maybe a 45 out of the downwind. Um, as I'm climbing out. Yeah, I, I don't know of anything official or semi-official like the AIM, keeping in mind the aeronautical information manual is not uh, policy, it's recommendations, but good recommendations that we should follow. Um, yeah, short of someone pointing out something there that specifically says not to do it, I can tell you every towered airport I've ever flown at, they expect and they give clearances to perform a left or a right downwind departure. And they expect you just to fly the normal distance downwind, keep climbing, like I already said, get above the pattern, but the ground track should just be a nice parallel downwind until you're out of their airspace. That's what they expect. So that's what I teach and it's always worked well. And that's been my experience as well, as far as, yeah. you know, going out of any towered air airports. So. Absolutely. And if we're doing touch and goes, we should already have the, the lateral spacing with the traffic. Um, you know, like the, say, say that's us on the left crosswind and there's someone doing a 45 entry, we shouldn't be turning that crosswind until we already have the lateral distance. So even if we don't do a good job climbing or it's a hot day and we have to baby the, the temperatures and so we're not doing a VY climb or something like that, we should still at least have that, that lateral separation from the traffic. So to work you now and then they would, they would turn base in front of us and we'd keep going straight. No, that's a good one. Cool. Anything else, Mark? Let's see. I don't think we have any other questions right now. Got all these fun pilots and nobody has anything to stump the DP. Come on. Yeah. Got to be so. Um, I've got one more for you then. Sure. Let me. Yeah, and here. this isn't so much stump the DPE, but more of a question of can you kind of go over? I don't know if there's a simplistic. Uh, uh, explanation on flight training devices and simulators and what you can log time on and what you can't or you know oh, for, I wish uh, it was simple um, yeah. I really wish it was so I don't remember the AC number off the top of my head so let's go let's go fishing together um, AC um, TD had a few acronyms here. Basic uh, aviation training device. Okay. So I just searched uh, FAA advisory circular AC flight training device A T D B A T D, and uh, let's see if this is the one that got updated recently. 2018. I think that's it. September 2018 was when they did a big rewrite of uh, the policy. It was, it was about then. So I'm guessing that's it. Let me just see what else we have here. AFS 810. That looks about right. Just open a couple here. All right. Device as a, oh, here we go. 2020. 
Uh, oh, this is by manufacturer. So there you go. Okay, so that might be an interesting reference if you're uh, wondering about a specific make and model. So that's right on FAA.gov. If you search for FAA approved aviation training devices, this should come up. Uh, let's just read here for a minute or so. So 61.4 Charlie. Hmm. Can't say I have that one memorized either. Let's go look at that real quick. Fun little rabbit hole to jump down. Did I say 61.4? Okay, so this is the reg. ENC, do, do, do. For which university do it? Okay, so this is the policy written into regulation that governs training devices in general. And then we've got um, 61136 Bravo. Let's go ahead and pull that up, which is more detailed guidance of FA approved aviation training devices and their use for training experience. So, um, Having looked at these in the past, it's been a while since I kind of went through them page by page, but I would say that that is, that, that regulation 61.4 and this advisory circular are what you're looking for. And um, beyond that, doing a Google search like I did and, and digging into some other details like this list by manufacturers would be the way to go. So I'm just curious what else they've got here because I'm, I'm intrigued by this list. I think I should... So I talked to you a few episodes ago about 8900.1, that's the fsims.fa.gov, uh, um, which is policy regulation from the FAA. Um, there is a difference between ATDs and FTDs. They talk about that here. They talk about the letter of agreement. We've, we talked about that uh, on a couple episodes also. I think the last one included about going by what's in the letter of authorization. And the letter of authorization can be different than current regulations and still be okay. Because somewhere in that reg, it might even be in that part 61, it talks about approved by the administrator or otherwise authorized, or there, there's like a catch all somewhere. Yeah. It's not jumping out at me. But that otherwise authorized means the FAA already gave a letter of authorization for that particular machine that allows you to log certain time in it. So that's why my first answer when we talk about logging time is always go to the letter of authorization. Yeah. So if you go to 60, uh, the 61.4 and look at C, I think it said the administrator can approve it. There it is. Yep. They may approve a device other than that for specific purposes. Boom. So there's a catch all written into policy. So that's a good point. Um, so I was just, this caught my eye, it's in bold. <laughs> Copy of the LOA must be provided to any individual using pilot time logged in me. So in the past, I, I wasn't sure when we talked about this on the last episode, whether that letter of agreement has to be displayed. You know, like when you, um, you look at the requirement for having the airworthiness certificate in the airplane, the reg specifically says it has to be on display. Now that's why the manufacturers use that clear plastic that you slide it into. Um, and that is a great check ride question, by the way, is, you know, if, if, if the registration is covering it or the airworthiness is turned around backwards or there's, you know, weight and balance papers in front of it, it's not on display. You're not legal to fly. Uh, little tangent there. That's airplanes. For the simulator, the um, letter of authorization doesn't ha say that it has to be on display, but I, I have heard or read this before. It has to, it must be provided to any individual. So the flight schools that I've done business with um, or where I was the chief flight instructor, we had a three ring binder um, where, you know, it was like the Hobbs meter, uh, the accounting book, but we also had a, a clear plastic protector that had the LOA either in the book or we actually framed it and hung it on the wall next to the simulator. Um, because of this very reason, anyone who comes into the flight school or the flying club to use the sim, they need to know what they're authorized to log and that letter of authorization is the official from the FAA for that machine. Um, and like we saw with the Redbird, you can just Google it and pull it up a lot of times. So a lot of good stuff there. I'm, uh, I'm actually gonna save this one in my flight training aids. Bookmark that. All right, cool. Good, uh, good question, good discussion. Very good. Anything else coming in? Uh, let's see, we've got one here. 
Uh, Sonia has a question. All right, go ahead, Sonia. Um, about logging time and also how does it apply to, um, well, about logging time, I'm just uh, starting to get somebody offered to act as safety pilot and a bit confused about what can be logged, how it's logged, and whether any of that log time counts towards training. Very good. Yes, uh, that one gets really confusing. So the good news is um, there's some good information. I'm thinking of an AOPA article we're going to go look up here real quick. Um, just to clarify the scenario, you're a private pilot working on an instrument rating. That's, yes. And you have a safety pilot who is also a private pilot, um, aircraft, single engine land, same category, class, all that. So, okay. So let's share. Actually, my, my question was more directed towards um, if I'm acting as safety pilot uh, for somebody okay. who's working on their instrument rating. Um, so I'm just typing in AOPA logging time as safety pilot. Let me give you the answer and then I'll show you the reference. When you are the safety pilot, you need to agree with the pilot flying that you will be the one acting as pilot in command while he or she is under the hood. So the time, let's just say it's a two hour flight with 1.6 under the hood. In your logbook, you would put 1.6 total flight time, PIC, single engine land, all that stuff, and not log anything for landings, and just put in the remarks that you were the safety pilot, okay? You don't have to say who it's for, but I think it's good to write in their name. Because you are literally, or officially is a better word, you are officially acting as the pilot in command as the safety pilot while they are under the hood they are logging pilot and command time as the sole manipulator controls, which is a discussion we already had today in this session. There's only one person acting as pilot and command at a time. The other person is logging pilot and command. When they're not wearing the hood and they're at the controls, they are both acting and logging PIC and you are just a passenger. So there's the quick answer. Um, so 91109 is where it talks about safety pilot stuff. Um, let's go ahead and just see what AOPA has here. I'm pretty sure both of these are going to be what I'm thinking of, but let me pull up a few. Uh, that's not the article I'm thinking of. This is something online members only, but uh, that should say exactly what I just said. There's the reference we looked at earlier, 6151 Echo. What else we got here? Logging time. This might be the article I'm thinking of. 2009, that sounds about right. Um, so that should be consistent with everything I just said. And then the last one was an error. Okay. So there's my quick answer. Um, uh, the official references are going to be uh, 91109 for safety pilot requirements and 6151 echo for logging pilot time. AOPA did a good job clarifying what I just explained about acting actually that you know let me search for that um acting pilot in command so aopa logging acting pilot in command um because that's really what it comes down to is and that's where people get confused because in our log books oh, that one had a narrative we only have one column in our log books that says pic you might want to consider using one of the blank columns in your log book or an electronic logbook where you actually have a separate column for logging PIC. So you have your acting as PIC and your logging PIC. There may be times where it's useful to split those up. And if you do it that way from early in your career, it's easy to add them together when you need to. Um, just something, just a suggestion. Let's see. Oh, here's something from the FAA. Who is this guy? This is from a field office, so he doesn't have his signature on here. This looks like something he replied in an email or something, but it could still be good info um, talking about the same stuff we're talking about. Um, defining the pilot in command. Yeah, I'm confident. You guys are going to see there's this sole nip of the controls. There's 6151. Yeah, everything you find should be very consistent with what I just shared. Be careful when you go to pilot forums 
where the answers are coming from fellow pilots. You don't always get good information that way. Try to stick with a trusted source, at least something like AOPA. But does that answer your specific question, Sonia? Um, yeah, I actually have about a dozen questions for <laughs> um, safety pilot. The other thing is, if I log PIC but don't act as PIC, would that count towards, for example, cross-country hours if we're over 50? So now for that to happen with a safety pilot scenario, that means now you're the pilot flying and you're wearing the hood. Is that what you mean to, to ask? Uh, no, still a safety pilot. Um, as safety pilot, even though you're acting as PIC, you're not the one navigating. So you should not log that as cross country. Um, when you look at the general definition of cross country, it basically says, and this would be 61.1 definitions, to count something as cross country, you need to be a pilot in an aircraft and you need to go somewhere other than where you took off using some type of navigation. I'm, I'm not quoting it exactly, but it basically says using pilotage, dead reckoning or radio navigation. And I always thought that was interesting. Like, why did they have to put that in there? If I get from point A to point B, didn't I get there somehow? <laughs> you know, didn't I use some type of navigation if I made it? And um, I think that the reason that they knew they had to do that is because what if you have a student under the hood and the flight instructor or the safety pilot just vectors them all the way to the airport and tells them to take off the hood when they're on short final? Did the pilot flying really navigate there? The answer is no. So you really shouldn't log it as cross country unless you navigate. So the idea, and, and it can be as simple as GPS, that's radio navigation. So the pilot flying who's under the hood follows some type of navigation, probably GPS, to get from airport one to airport two. And because they're the ones that did the navigating, they log it as cross country. You can't double dip on the cross country. Only one person logs the cross country. Uh, the safety pilot gets to log the, um, basically can think of it like conditions of flight, like day or night. So if it's a night flight, then you both put it in night in your logbook. Um, and total time, again, would go in the, let's just say the pilot flying, wearing the hoods in the left seat. So left seat pilot flies the whole flight time. The right seat safety pilot only logs PIC the time that the left seat pilot's under the hood. Cross country only goes to the person who's actually on the controls flying and navigating. Uh, landings only go to the person doing the takeoff and landing. Did I miss anything? I think that cover, I'm thinking of all the columns in a logbook. Uh, of course, if it's single engine, multi-engine, that goes to both people. Um, yeah, all right, what else you got? I got more for that. Keep it going, we're good. Um, so I'm working on my complex high performance rating about halfway through by the hours required by the place I'm renting for, for insurance purposes. But i um, getting a little bit of confused background as to what if um, somebody asked me to have a safety pilot um, where I'm not checked off, but I'm working on it. So, um, real quick, I, I see that we're going over an hour here. Um, again, no time limit on these, but if anyone has other uh, obligations or uh, appointments you need to go, then uh, by all means, uh, don't feel like you're trapped here. Thank you for being here live. We, we appreciate you guys. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to the ECFRs. Oops, let me do it up here. And, um, so before you get the complex high performance endorsement, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Um, tell, tell me again why you were saying safety pilot. Because usually before you have the endorsement, you're only going to be flying with an instructor. So what's the scenario? So what if somebody um, asked me to go a safety pilot for a flight in a complex? Can't pilot? do that. No, you can't do that. That's, that's different than what we were talking about earlier, like um, on the last episode, I think it was, I used the example of when I was going for my high performance endorsement, I'm with my instructor in a 182 before I have the high performance endorsement, I'm the sole manipulator of the controls in an aircraft in which I am rated, meaning category and class, single engine land. I was able to log PIC while he was acting as PIC. Okay, that's different than what you're saying. If you're with someone who's not a flight instructor, you do not yet have the endorsement, you cannot be their safety pilot because again, 
the safety pilot is the one acting as PIC. You're not qualified to do that until you get the endorsement. So definitely that one's black and white. Um, no being a safety pilot. The, the, only, the easy way to remember it is you can only be a safety pilot in an airplane in which you are current and legal to solo. That's, that's all you got to remember. If you're not current and legal to solo that particular aircraft, you cannot be the safety pilot. Mm -hmm. So good one. What else? Did we lose Sonia? I'm still, no, I'm still oh, here. Did you, did you have more related questions? Um, I would have to think through and to see if that answers everything, but I was also wondering what if, um, what if there's somebody who's a CFI instrument rated, um, working either under CFI two or doing flights for fun or other reasons, um, asking for somebody to go as a safety pilot in case there are VFR conditions. Would okay. any of that change? So again, make sure I understand the scenario. Um, so VFR conditions, um, we got a flight instructor who's working on their double eye that wants to go out and shoot approaches. So they're, they're gonna be doing it in the right seat. Not that it matters what seat you're in, I'm just painting the picture. Um, they wanna go under the hood to practice flying instruments from the right seat. You're asking what, what are the qualifications for their safety pilot that's gonna sit in the left seat? Is that the question? Yeah, in case, um, would any of that change in regards to um, um, complex airplanes and rating? Actually, or it does change a little bit because as a flight instructor, well, let me think of this through for a second. <laughs> You're really making me think, I love this. Um, so clearly anyone who's um, a private pilot or better that's current on the airplane can be their safety pilot. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're a flight instructor or not, um, the, uh, or whether the person in the right seat's a flight instructor or not. So that, that's all the same. So let me talk through, as a flight instructor, I am allowed to put on the hood in VFR conditions to demonstrate. Sometimes I do that um, because I want to demonstrate an approach for the applicant and I am in need of logging an official approach for myself. <laughs> and, you know, I haven't made it down to the local flight school to jump on the simulator. And um, it's, a, it's actually an interesting, uh, you know, usually we talk about the difference between being current and being proficient, like current is the minimum, proficient is better. I'm the opposite. I'm always teaching instruments and I'm flying my airline, you know, when we're not grounded for the virus stuff. And I feel like I'm very proficient all the time. I have to work hard to get my six approaches in six months to be legally current. So it's kind of a reverse problem. But anyway, um, as the instructor, I can put on the hood and continue providing dual instruction, but my client in the left seat becomes my safety pilot. And I'm going to stick with the same answer. It does not change like that pilot. He, he or she has to be current and rated to be my safety pilot while I shoot that approach under the hood because we're not IFR, uh, we're in simulated conditions, we're required to have the safety pilot per part 91. So yeah, it's, it's exactly the same. It doesn't change if there's a, an instructor. I just had to think through that. <laughs> so good stuff. Oh, is it getting warm in here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, like I said, we're, uh, we're over the hour mark, but um, any final questions before we call it a day? Cool. I think we're good. Thank you everyone again for uh, being here live. And um, uh, the registration is open for Tuesday and Saturday. If you guys want to jump on, um, we'll, we'll do that. I did change the times, I think, on next Saturday. So just watch that. And um, uh, for anyone watching this on the recording, um, by the time it's online, you should be able to go and see the timestamps like we talked about at the beginning and just jump to different sections. So hopefully that's useful for you guys. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Have a good one. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Take care.